and Happy New Year to all our viewers. You're welcome to the conversation here on New Central Television, where we bring you a breakdown of all the biggest political stories happening on the continent. I am Benga Aborowa. And I am Rita Omodia. For that. <laughs> what would you say were some of your standout political stories for last well, year? Well, some of the standout, I think it was uh, this eight note story, Debbie, the death oh, okay. of Debbie. Of course, we also had South Africa, uh, Jacob Zuma, and of course, the corruption trial mm -hmm. going on. We also had Tunisia, now the, uh, the suspension of parliament. We had yeah. the president taking over. I think we also had lots of coups in Africa, Mali, it West was, Africa, Mali, Guinea. What was going on? It, it was indeed a year that was filled with political intrigues um you like you rightly said uh, we didn't only lose uh, idris debi itno in um battle the yes. president of tanzania battle, so that's, that's also it. died of coronavirus we also had yeah john magafuli yes john and then magafuli we had the passed. first new president there in uh, tunisia it was, no, not tunisia we uh, had tanzania, in tanzania yeah, yes. madam sulu hassan it was also an election year we, it saw more than 12 elections. And last some year. supposed elections in Libya, mm -hmm. unfortunately, we did not get to see Carry the election. Carryover elections, Somalia and Libya. And uh, we'll be looking uh, more into it this year. But talking about Libya, uh, Libya was among the Arab Spring nations. And since a revolution uh, toppled the government a decade ago, the government of Marwan Gaddafi, it has not known peace nor political stability. But after months of arduous negotiations and international mediation, there were fresh hopes for the future. Warren Sides signed the United Nations-sponsored ceasefire deal, formed a unity government, and agreed to hold elections on December the 24th. But the head of the Electoral Commission has now dissolved all electoral committees just days before polling stations were due to open. What does this mean for the future of the country? What is the future for Libya? And of course, to begin the conversation, we have a guest with us, and that is Anon Kuruleko Moyo, a political analyst at TNGO and UCT Political Science alumni. It's so good to have you join us on the conversation. Uh, thank you very much for having me. All right, let's go straight to business. The, with the postponement of elections in Libya, will you say the political process in Libya failed? And do you think international intervention might have played a role here? Um, I believe uh, most certainly I'm more interested in the South African breaking news. Um, but one of the things and analyses that I wanted to bring forward is that all things are historically connected. And therefore, our analyses that are usually looking at either officials and their actions and the outcomes of elections and voter uh, behavior do not account for historical things, which also include international, um, continuous international behavior that influences outcomes in African political processes. So definitely not answer. Yes. Now, Nkuleko, the United Nations said it was crucial for uh, Libya to hold elections. The international community said it is paramount to hold elections. But we see a situation here where the, despise, the, the figures, the, the people that have come up to the, the leading figures, uh, Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, uh, General... Um, the Eastern Commander, um, Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, uh, we have Beba, we also have General Khalifa after. People are saying that the winner most likely uh, will tear apart Libya and it's better not to have elections with these divisive uh, figures. Do you share the same sentiments? I certainly uh, share the sentiment, and I think I want to quote one of a critical leader, Singaporean leader, Rikwan, who says that it takes years to transform a people's belief system. So to impose democracy or to have pushed very hard at the international level for elections to happen before having the cultural changes or internal changes of people's views and expectations of their own, their own livelihood, their own futures, is what has inhibited the ability for a successful 
and peaceful transition into democratic power in the country. Now, if there is a focus, an internal focus in being able to transform people's uh, imaginations of what leadership should look like on their own terms, it would take much more longer. But certainly the ability to see credible leaders that are trusted by the actual citizens would be uh, an outcome we can expect over time. So it is a rushed uh, expectation, but also one that cannot secure positive outcomes unless there is massive participation and agreement with what the future, even the liberal uh, democratic future, looks like for uh, the Libyan uh, society. Now, Ms. Moyo, uh, just to follow up on that, I'm very glad that you mentioned that the entire process uh, was rushed, and you need uh, a fertile ground, and you need the people uh, to get with the program before you impose democracy. So my question to you is this. Uh, you look at the Gulf uh, Petro Monarchies, Oman, Qatar, uh, Libya is a country that has been used to strong men. Uh, Gaddafi was in power for over 40 years. Is democracy in itself a uh, one-size-fits-all uh, form of government, or should countries evolve their own systems? And it's the international community... Uh, to are uh, they rushing Libya into democracy uh, when you still have uh, obvious fault lines in the system? Uh, thank you very much for mentioning the behavioral aspect of it. So we usually focus on leaders and their charisma, and we never really think about the voter behavior, and that's due to historical references of thinking about people as thinking along religious and ethnic lines, and never along the securing of their own needs. Now, a leader usually reflects people who believe that the person, whether it's Gaddafi, whoever is going to be put in the front line, whether it's the guerrilla movement or whatever, embodies the people's aspirations and can be able to secure their needs. So certainly, if we are to be able to go back and trust that citizens, even when they act in uh, spouts of violence or extreme forms of civil unrest, are actually communicating uh, a need. And that requires us to think of each country, each territory historically. Um, and that history usually its religious needs. So, you know, if you think about Tunisia, for instance, this is a great example. Imagine the shock of people putting in a government, a government who ended up complying with UN desires, mm -hmm. who made the hijabi uh, in public spaces um, uh, illegal, banned it. Imagine that transition from being uh, people who had religious outcomes that were based on your beliefs to having a leader basically saying you cannot practice your religion in public so that we appear more westernized, more Line with what the international community is asking. So if you think about that, each country would have to have its own specific type of liberated or more human-centric uh, democracies, which don't look like what the US or the British uh, empires have been able to uh, uh, get for themselves over the years, which was also informed by the time and space in which those democracies were born. Okay, well, our fingers are crossed. I think they gave some updates, uh, January 24, of which the elections were postponed to, and, of course, parliamentary elections for February 15. And it's so good that you mentioned the issue of Tunisia. And we know that Tunisia's political crisis began in July when the president sacked the prime minister, suspended parliament, and assumed executive power. Now, Kai Saeed insisted it was not a coup. Six months on, he still has not named a prime minister nor revealed plans for reform, and he has extended his pause until further notice. We had protesters angry at the president, and he faced supporters who insisted Said was carrying out the people's will. Tunisia is often called the only success story of the Arab Spring, but 10 years on, its democracy is looking fragile. Tunisia will also hold a constitutional referendum next July, and President Kai Said announced on Monday, months after the seas brought pause, he moves in his opponents called the coup. Now, in a speech on national television on Monday, he said that Parliament of Tunisia would remain suspended until Tunisians vote for a replacement assembly on December 17, 2022. And the question comes, could Tunisia return to dictatorship or what exactly is next for Tunisia? 
we'd have to allow the two unions again the opportunity to decide. And that decision doesn't look like a single form decision because now you're looking at people's needs, uh, the promises of external support and government intentions. So this is not going to be something that can be resolved of one election or two elections, but a continuous change within the views and expectations of the people. And also very strict judicial response to abuse of power because we cannot pretend that leaders do not take advantage of situations of crisis to be able to ensure that they continue to control key elements of a governing system to continue to oppress uh, the masses of the people. Hello? Okay. Um, now, uh, the Tunisian president, he's not a fan of the 2014 constitution, uh, that, uh, and it's said that a nationwide public consultation will take place from the 1st of January to March is encouraged Tunisians to go on the internet and choose areas where they want changes. And it said uh, by the by July they will vote on that. Do you think uh, this will bring about the necessary change that Tunisians desire? And the Western world has also said, you know, it needs to return uh, democratic instruments and bring back the parliament and uh, recall the prime minister. Thank you, Philip, because if you think about it, the response is even suggesting that this is an in part concession because as the situation has grown untenable and almost unbearable to justify internationally, you want to be able as a leader, and this is where charismatic leadership, we have to understand the intentions of people who assume dictatorial or extreme control over their territories. So this is a concession, but doesn't necessarily mean that the entire ethic or even the intention of the leader is going to seize and we would see a full democratic transition beyond that point. So it's a simple political game um, which uh, should favor him if people are to expect better outcomes from the process when he certainly has kept most of his uh, ethic and intentions in place and unmoved. So those minor tweaks and changes I'm certainly going to give us uh, a certain uh, approach to imagining that the situation is going to uh, be better, but rather that the government is trying to negotiate whatever losses, whatever international image uh, that has been damaged by the current situation in its dams. Well, there's been a really serious issue in Tunisia there, but if we also look at a situation in 2021, Chad was also on the limelight, if you would agree with me. And the tensions have been high in Chad since the sudden death of President Idris Deby in 2021. It was really shocking because we had him on the battlefield and then the next thing we heard of his death. And Deby's son, Mohammed Idris Deby Itno, was immediately announced as his successor. But till then, we do not have a major uh, political government there. And the Transitional Council has 18 months to rule. So what would you say to the situation, especially the political structure and stability in Chad? Um, certainly because of the nature um, of the change in presidency, we should be less uh, um, negatively expecting that the outcome might deteriorate. But thinking about the qualities of the leader that has been put in place, and I think I want to go back to being able to think of voters and citizens as people have certain aspirations, who want those aspirations to be embodied by a leader that believe is going to make decisions in their favor. So we'd have to look at the existing sectors of society, how those people have imagined themselves, and whether or not the current uh, sitting leader and the transitioning uh, successor is going to embody the imagination of the people. So I think because of the nature of the passing, which is quite a hypothetic thing, people are likely to be more patient, which means that we are likely to see a positive outcome, depending on whether or not they're able to put forward faces and names that align with the imagination of the people. And we always know how these things play out in Africa. Uh, should a certain kind of uh, image appear that doesn't align with people's imagination, violence is almost a determined outcome of the process. So we'd have to really hope that the correct official who has the embodiment is able to take on the space that has been left. The nature of the passing, very important in us understanding the situation might really turn out uh, for the positive. Now, Ms. Moyu, looking at the interest in geopolitics of uh, politics in Africa, uh, it seems that the same rule doesn't apply to all countries because uh, when you don't follow the constitutional order, the first thing that happens is they kick you out of the African Union or your regional uh, bloc. But this wasn't the case with Chad. The president of the National Assembly was meant to take over, but because of geopolitical interest, France uh, needs the support of Chad. They need the Chadian army to be strong. Uh, there are lots of transnational banditry and terrorist 
in that region. And Chad is one of the strongest uh, military countries there. Nigeria, too, didn't come out to condemn uh, the lack of transition to the constitutional, to the person that was meant to constitutionally take over after the death of Idris Deby. So, do the people's will, and that's my question, the people, the ordinary Chadians, are the rules respected here or uh, the international community is just, or they're just doing it for diplomacy's sake? Which one takes precedence or which should, ideally? To be really fair, because what in an ideal democratic situation should uh, take uh, precedence is the people's will. But imagine what it would be like during a pandemic, a global crisis, to have a special election where even the expectation that such uh, the resources that need to be put in place. So you're thinking about a special case requires special outcomes. Obviously, the special outcomes then bring in the international community. So certainly, I'd say in this instance, those geopolitical interests, which is also a fair thing we have, I think. In in this instance to not take the aggressive point in thinking about external forces influencing what's going on when in this instance it was for the benefit of everybody to be able to really overlook certain things to ensure that there was a functional state apparatus while the country figures out what transition would look like. So that is when the people's will will then come in because it is a special circumstance that required special attention. So they do get a, a, a bit of a scapegoat in this instance and that is the international community and it does benefit everybody because we all do want for regions to remain uh, against uh, violent uh, circumstances and for the economies to continue to function even under the instances of having lost credible leadership uh, at a very unfortunate time. You know, when you're talking about will power, it reminds me of Guinea and Mali, where we have people protesting against the military system of government and demanding for a democratic system of government. Okay, so we started from North Africa. We're, we're reviewing the political highlights that made uh, political highlights in 2021. So we move over to South Africa now. And Jacob Zuma is one of South Africa's foremost anti appetite fighters, an important element of the South African story since the 1960s, and one whose name is often greeted with mixed reactions. But Juma was, Zuma rather, was jailed for failing to appear before a commission seeking to ask him questions on some corruption allegations. Moyo, this was a very thrilling one. We see a former South African president. Yeah, yeah, on president going for a 15-month uh, uh, court sentence due to contempt of court. Uh, what did successful conviction of Jacob Zuma mean to other countries on the continent whose past leaders might have had a slew of atrocities against their people, but because of the position as a president, uh, they were above the law? Um, I do believe in this instance, and this might be controversial, but as a South African, I might take the controversy line here, that uh, we are really picking a low-hanging fruit. Now, Jacob Zuma does have a long-standing history of uh, problems with the judiciary system, all ranging from 2008, with personal allegation of like sexual assault, moving into uh, corruption uh, charges against his decisions uh, to renovate his house in 2016. So you have this long-standing, and more importantly, the arms deal. So you have this long-standing history of a man who has certainly abused power. But is it to have been enough to use a small deterrent in a system that they set up for themselves? So remember the Zondo Commission was set up by the ANC in the government forces power to be able to start to charge corruption cases. But certainly the power and even the lack of authentic strength that some of the uh, people who went uh, 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 and appeared in the Zulu Commission does suggest that Zuma might be liable for a lot of cases which he must be tried for. It was even shocking to see a former president uh, actually go to prison. It was a shocking thing. But when the medical parole happened, we understood that, well, power is power remain that way. So it will mean a lot for the South African corruption scene, but it's not enough to assume that this is going to inform any changes because certainly uh, those who evade power at a much more higher level, uh, resulting in genocidal outcomes and deaths and like uh, total mistrust of their governments, will still abuse those powers until there is change from within judicial strengthening and military uh, evaluation of who has power when and how does that power get used. So Jacob Zuma can go to jail for OMK. It doesn't really change how we think about Africa and the tensions with power and leaders uh, in the continent. I could be wrong, I stand to be corrected, mm -hmm. but it's interesting mm -hmm. to see how the case is going to develop over time.
Now, talking about Jacob Zuma going to jail, it did have reverberating effects uh, around uh, South Africa. Definitely. We did see the aftermath, uh, the riots, and what Protests. happened. Jacob Zuma was a president under an ANC government, and ANC government uh, is currently in power in South Africa. Do you think, because uh, a lot of people were angry and they thought, you know, why would you jail uh, one of ours? Uh, there's this aura or there was this aura uh, around the former president that he might have been an untouchable uh, what are the implications of this to the political dynamics in uh, south africa and uh would it affect the anc's chances in future polls positively or negatively um thank you for phrasing that question i mean certainly uh, the anc so the anc has been in power since the transition into democratic south africa 1996 uh, nelson mandela the world uh, acclaimed uh, peacemaker and then you had Tabumbe, Tabumbe was removed and then Jacob Zuma. Now this is very really important. When Tabumbe was removed, we had an HIV and AIDS pandemic in the country. Now if you look at which regions were affected and you now look at the kinds of people that are supporting Jacob Zuma, so mostly the Guazulu Natal region, whatever people mm. see as the tribal link because the Zulu uh, tribe and Jacob Zuma being of the Zulu descent has been made as a connecting force or explanation for why there was social unrest in specific regions when he was uh, uh, jailed. It doesn't account for something very crucial which happened in the ANC when the liberation movement was transitioning from liberation to a majoritarian democratic party. There were people, including Jacob Zuma, who had left the country to go and train to be actual guerrillas of warfare. When the transition happened in 1994, the decision wasn't from a guerrilla warfare, it was through concessions of leaders of the same movement. So you have an ANC that has always been split into two, and the different presidents actually represent those splittings. But because people are poor and people expected the country to be in a different place, people are reacting to the ANC in relation to their needs. And Jacob Zuma does represent someone who has represented their faction within the ANC. Okay, thank you so much for that analysis on Jacob Zuma. Of course, our fingers are crossed watching what exactly is going to happen next for this uh, former South African president, Jacob Zuma. Now, of course, we'll go on a quick break, but when we come back, we'll still be on the conversation and we'll definitely still have more. And we'll also cross over to other political highlights in East and West Africa. Do stay tuned. We still have Moyo Nonkulieko with us discussing major stories at the Shape the Year 2021. Now, moving to West Africa. In August last year, uh, the military took over power and uh, uh, removed the democratically elected uh, president, uh, Mr. Bubak Keita, uh, from power. Now, Moyo, my question is this. Uh, we also saw a resurgence of uh, coup d'etats not only in Mali, also in Guinea. You had a president that had stayed in power for more than two terms. He changed the constitution. I'm talking about Alpha Conde, and they led to protests. People were died, and people were killed in those protests. Are we seeing a return back to the 1980s, uh, where it was fashionable for uh, men in uniform to leave their barracks and take over power? And are there ever legitimate grounds to remove a democratically elected uh, government from power, even when they obviously violate the constitution and extend uh, constitutional term limits. Thank you for your question. That is a beautiful formulated question because I wanted to say earlier on that if you look at the South African case uh, and all of the cases we're dealing with, we must acknowledge that we have unfinished business. So to think of it as a regression is uh, almost an impractical historical reflection. We want to think of it as in continuing issues that emanate from poor solutions at a time where people were desperate for change. So if we are to think of what it means to have crews still continue in this current day and age, we need to think about what are kinds of institutions need to be strengthened. So certainly there's never going to be a justification for the removal of a president. But when powers 
are used against the people. The military leaders usually want to find a justification to say that they're acting in the interest of citizens who are under abuse. They themselves using a kind of power that has the ability to abuse and force others to buy into their ideologies. And these changes really need to continuously be challenged from a much more stricter lens. So military power is not something we imagine as a cultural revolution where people need to decide for themselves. They need to be punished and the international bodies do have a right and a responsibility of protection, but that usually gives us more problems and solutions. So again, we have an issue that might take at least 100 years when we put all of these years put together of ensuring credible, functional governments in Africa. Well, yeah, I'd, like, I'd like to follow up on your thoughts there. Uh, you said mm. they have no business in taking over. It's just an excuse. The military should stay out of uh, governors. But when you have a situation where you have a democratically elected uh, government that is not listening to the yearnings of the people and is showing autocratic tendencies, you oftentimes have the African Union. It's uh, A lot of people have tagged it uh, as an old boys club. They protect the interest of one another and they don't want to intervene in the domestic affairs of the country. So. Uh, are the people just going to sit back and wait for the next electoral cycle uh, before change can be done? Because, uh, yes. Unfortunately, yes, people do have to face the consequences of having putting certain leaders uh, in place. But when those leaders change the constitution to remain in power, I believe that there really should be our activism, our criticism should go towards the bodies that are capable of evaluating and even putting measures at, you know, when you say that governments' uh, faces and leaders should be removed from certain seats in the AU, and that doesn't happen, and we think, oh, something must really be broken. The people cannot use the military because then they have set a precedent to say that when others don't like a certain sitting government, they should cause unrest and elect their own leadership, uh, put in place rather their own leadership without following the election cycles, then that president is a... Uh, you know, slippery slope. They're going to continue to do that because politics is politics. It's about interest. So I certainly believe that it is the governing bodies at an international level that we should be measuring our criticism against in order to ensure that powers are put in check all the time. But people certainly have to remain with the governments that they've been powerful for the times that the Constitution has stipulated. And still talking about coups, apart from Mali in West Africa, we also had, uh, we all, apart from Guinea rather, we also had Mali experience <laughs> those two countries. We also had Guinea experience the same thing in, uh, in coups. Now, the question comes, do you think that international support has actually affected political stability in West Africa? We should always think about what is in West Africa and in whose benefit uh, the, the disruption of certain regions always hands out. And so when you think about mm. oil production and oil prices and the performance of a country or even its negotiating power, that answer may seem simplistic and quite, uh, uh, you would think, judgmental, but it is a good answer to think about it. So when certain powers aren't able to intervene in the benefit of peace, or resolutions of certain uh, disruptions in those regions, you're thinking about what is happening at the economic world level. And we certainly know that West Africa should be protected at all costs because that is a very complex nuance and those powers are quite intentional about keeping certain regions in certain terms to be able to benefit uh, from uh, those disruptions at an economic level. But well, do you feel that uh, Mali needs regional support to boost its democracy? extreme and not just money but i believe especially the west and you think about what happened in the 70s which was the benefit of all producing countries and you think about all of the benefits of what the west has been able so the west of africa has been able to provide to the rest of the world that should be as an economic response rather than focusing on building multiple economies it should be a priority for the Af african union to protect certain territories even against the militaries within those territories to ensure Sure that good governance, provision of resources for the people, and a continued stable geographical so that block has to depend on each other in order for that stability to remain in place. And even later on, they bolster their military response to external 
external forces. But until we get that block moving in the same direction through the AU, it is highly unlikely that the instabilities will stop anytime soon. So as soon as one recovers, then you have an issue cropping up in Nigeria. As soon as the other one recovers, you have an issue cropping up. And this is an engineered and a consistent political tool that has been used, and we all know to what and to whose benefit. So it is high time that African leaders actually took that responsibility more seriously than they have in the past. Now, um, moving away from West Africa, let's go to East Africa, where more than a year ago, brothers have been at war in Ethiopia as national forces and the Great People's Liberation Front are currently engulfed in one of the world's most disturbing security issues. Nobel Peace Prize winning Prime Minister of uh, Ethiopia, Abiy Ahmed, uh, did think it was going to be a quick operation to defeat the people's uh, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, but they've been uh, stuck in it for more than a year, and uh, it's led to thousands uh, of deaths, and a lot of people have been displaced. Uh, the conflict uh, between the Ethiopian Federal Forces and the Tigray uh, People's Liberation Front has spread uh, beyond Tigray. Now, my question to you is, uh, we've seen a lot of concerted uh, diplomatic efforts uh, trying to you know, end this conflict, but uh, it seems to just uh, keep drawing on and on. Does diplomacy ever work? Because, I mean, the Tigray peoples, no one is respecting the ceasefires, and uh, at the end of the day, it's the people that are suffering. So uh, what might bring this conflict to an end? Correct diplomacy and accountability internally. I want to bring a good example, and I'm sorry that I keep bringing all of these other African countries. Mm. I had attended a conference uh, which was looking at Cabo Delgado, which is in Mozambique, and how there is a green situation. Fortunately, there were a lot of African Union uh, leaders, ambassadors uh, within the structure that I attended. And one of the key things that came out of that was if you have a country that is uh, performing poorly at the GDP level, you have a high youth. Uh, count or enough people who are constantly under degrading circumstances, you have a recipe for disaster because once those uh, individuals are armed, you cannot control the fire. So what you want to do is to have programs, responsive programs that actually reintegrate uh, those kinds of youth at risk and individuals in society into functional systems and functional economies in order to be able to then do. And I think it was uh, Central Africa, it was uh, Central African Republic that was able to do that, to actually negotiate getting the arms from the people in exchange, giving them jobs, giving them a re-entry into society. So what we can imagine is that it is possible this correct diplomacy, giving funds to an accountable government that actually wants to institute this really integration process and then if it is the people of the territories they are likely to actually give up arms in the instance that they negotiated well back into society with their needs uh quote unquote uh given a provision for uh from whatever point that those negotiations start until the end so it will take time again because you have to negotiate with the leaders of the armed forces the tplf and then once the leaders have come on the side you want to negotiate a giving up a season of arms and a provision of people's needs. And governments usually uh, miss that because they imagine that people have arterial motives for it. Or so the TLP does not have arterial motives that go beyond the fact that there was once a despondent and needy youth that could be taken advantage of by uh, armed forces. You know, it's an irony that Abiy Ahmed actually won Nobel Peace Prize, and yet we're still having so much disruptions. And Kiyot, when I saw that story, and of course, all that's going on in Ethiopia, it was really, really a, a sad one for Abiy Ahmed. One would have expected a lot from him. And not only Abiy Ahmed, even the, the Northern People's Liberation Front, we also had of human rights violations from both sides, both the Ethiopian government and, of course, the TPLF. And there were cases of human rights violations. How do you think that um, justice will actually be served for these people? Um, so to be very honest, and I'm going to take a quote that came from 200 years ago, uh, Marx says that the problem with liberal rights is that they give the ideological, which is the written form of you have the right, the access to this, no abuse of power and whatnot, but they do not actually give a provision for how that is going to translate to material benefit of the people. Um, if you'd quickly run into the situation of another local 
Peace Prize uh, winner Desmond Tutu who recently passed. The conflicting reaction of South Africans to his legacy is because peace offerings, Nobel Peace Prize, TRCs, give a fundamental reaction to what we expect or the idea of a state, but if they do not answer mm. people's needs, so I'd say if you had hungry young men running around in Ethiopia, this situation was inevitable. So to have a Nobel Peace Prize winner does not translate to having a person who understands how to respond to a people's needs. And then you have people who still have authoritarian armors who have quite, quite differently value ethics from how the, the, the West sees them, like uh, Hame and Rwanda, who are able to respond to the people's needs and provide for those needs. And that's always going to be the question. Are you able to provide for the people's needs enough for them to comply with the legitimacy of your government? So does a Nobel Peace Prize give you the ability to translate uh, those capabilities? Certainly not. So we should never even think of truth and reconciliation commissions, Nobel Peace Prizes as meaning anything to a person in the street who just wants to make an honest living or who wants a government to be able to take care of their basic needs. Thank you very much. And there's no way uh, we can talk about East Africa without talking about uh, the East African economic powerhouse. I'm talking about Kenya uh, mm. politics. Uh, this year, there will be a general elections in Kenya. Uh, President Uru Kenyatta will be completing his second tenure in office. And we do know what politics on the continent is like. It's a big deal. And the post-election violence of 2007 is still a very fresh in people's minds. My question to you is, why do we have this a winner-takes-all uh, mentality in Africa? And uh, there's a lot of uh, apprehensiveness and palpable tension in the air, uh, especially during an election year. It's almost like a do-or-die affair, and it's called a civic exercise. Uh, let's say let's uh, let's say it's a mixture of two things: scarcity mentality, the fact that there's never enough government funds, never enough provisions, never enough external support to provide for each and every need or to solve all of the solutions. The second one is we have called it the wrong thing for a very long time until it has actually transpired in society. There is no such thing as ethnic. Uh, conflicts for their own sake. It is usually interest and trust. So if people believe that a leader who looks like them speaks their language is going to be able to ensure their uh, success in society, anybody who does not look like that leader or speak that language is going to be suspicious of whether or not their needs are going to be met in that democratic appeal. And that is how people will vote. People will vote in line with whom they believe is going to embody their imaginations. Kenya is a very interesting case. One of my favorite African cases because I believe that over time what's going to happen is that you will find an expression of a possibility outside of those ethnic divide, assumed ethnic divide, and that is just going to be dependent on whether the government is going to be able to see the economy do a bit better. So the more that the economy thrives, the more that all of the resources are able to be shared across regions, and those regions will inevitably uh, have different people from different forms of like identity groups, and that might see a difference in tension. But until that happens, people will continue to be suspicious of who is in power and who that power represents and stands to benefit. So that is why it is a winner's takes all, because it is a matter of how limited resources are going to be shared across which region, population, body, identity group is going to stand to benefit the most. And if you think about that, we call that problem corruption, ethnic problems. I think there is a much more nuanced thing if we think about it as benefit sharing and interest. Uh, since uh, elections are on the highlight for 2022, let's look at the issue of vote buying and money politics, which has, of course, been a major characteristic for African or rather politics in general. So, how would you say we can handle an issue of vote buying and, of course, a part of uh, 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 vote buying in politics where we can at least have a man from the people, people that uh, a man that people want to actually govern them and Without not because of money inducement? Yes. <laughs> Financial, I think that's the thing is people like there is a charismatic form and we do it in political science. People want to imagine that there is an embodiment of power and truth, right? Which then comes with all of the things that inform the judiciary, judiciary functional uh, capabilities, accountability, etc. But there's also a serious issue. A lot of things that are going to happen in the next few years are going to reflect how terribly each country is impacted by the pandemic. Now, we will not be thinking about that when we imagine that the same territories are repeating cycles of historical tensions and not 
actually absorbing all of the problems and all of the tensions as they change. So the 2022 movement should be focusing on recovery, whether or not people can be able to put in power governments that can help them recover. And then people will have the ability in the next cycle to then vote in accordance to a betterment and self-appreciation. So unfortunately, currently, the economic situation, financial benefit is going to be tough because people are impacted by a global uh, setback. And after that setback, we might think about politics as we've known them taking back center stage. So any leader coming up might okay. take advantage uh, of those uh, those problems that exist in, in whatever territory. In fact, it cannot go across the entire Africa. All right, well, so much, so much highlights for 2021. You have a all packed and of course 2021 was really packed with political atmosphere and we're waiting to see what will happen in 2022 especially when it comes to elections because this is the heart integrity of any government thank you so much more your non your non name non -Kuleko. Non -Kuleko. Non -Kuleko. thank, <laughs> thank you, you for much. joining us on the conversation thank you very much for having me there's so much to expect in 2022. I mean, uh, especially with the resignation of uh, Sudan's Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok, which was quite shocking. Yes. Uh, quite a lot happening uh, on the political scene. And uh, of course, the big elections, the postponed elections in Somalia for Libya. and Libya, and of course, uh, Kenya. Uh, but do, you, do, you, do you actually think we'll have elections January 24 in Libya? Um, it won't happen. Of course, one month is such a short notice, but hopefully towards the end of the year. And we'll be discussing our projections Definitely. for the year and more on Wednesday uh, when we're back on the conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, doing this. I am Benga Borowa. And I'm Rita Modia. Join us again Wednesday and Friday, 5 p.m. West African time for more discussions on the conversation. <laughs>